How's it going, guys? How's everyone doing this morning? Um, so to kind of start things off, uh, so I know I had mentioned last stream that I was thinking about maybe doing a different concept or something. Um, well, we're, we're going to keep going with the dog for right now. Um, and I'm going to try and find something that, you know, will be fun to do on stream. Um, I have a couple of ideas of things. Um, but, you know, I had kind of spent a little bit of time off stream kind of revising some of the dog sculpts. Like I, let me see if I had saved a version before this. Um, no, it wasn't this version. I don't, actually it might've been this version, but the eyes were getting really small and there was just like some proportional changes that I need to make. So I went ahead and did that and I kind of felt like things were a little bit more in line with, um, what I was expecting and kind of what I was wanting for the sculpt. So because of that, I feel like we're pretty close to kind of like solving a majority of the primary forms. So what I'm gonna try and do today is just get like as much done on the sculpt and maybe potentially move into some of those secondary forms and like kind of detailing, which is gonna be a little bit, um, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to address it because like with this breed of dog, obviously they're covered in hair, but um, I started to look at like some references for like hairless dogs and things like that. So I thought maybe it might be cool to kind of introduce some of that detailing and things, um, you know, just to, why not, you know, because I'm not going to put hair on this guy. So, um, so that's kind of what I was thinking. Um, that being said, for those of you who don't know who are new to the stream, my name is Jared Chavez. Um, I'm a senior character artist in the games industry. I currently work at Firewalk Studios. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about me. I like to make characters, like to make, you know, creatures, different things like that, which is kind of what I wanted to make on this stream today. But um, I think that's what I'm going to do next stream is I'm going to try and make some creatures or monsters or something. So I'm going to try and find a concept of something that I like, something that'll be fun. Um, and then we can kind of work on that stuff instead next time. So that's kind of what's going on. Um, if you've never been a part of these streams, uh, what I like to do is, you know, just sculpt and any questions that come up, whether it's related to sculpting, uh, character art, game industry, whatever, feel free to let me know. We can chat about it. If you want to talk about games, you want to talk about movies, whatever you guys want to talk about, that's what I am open to. Um, you know, always, always happy to strike a conversation. So um, like I said, hopefully everyone's morning is going well so far. Um, I know for me, it's, it is early, you know, it's seven o'clock where I am at. So the sun is just coming out, but hopefully you, you guys all got some rest and have had productive days if you're in a different location. So, um, like I had mentioned, uh, what I was really struggling with on this guy was getting a good look to the profile and like the eyes. I felt like they were getting really, really small after the last sculpt. Um, so I went in and did some rebalancing just to kind of like pull things a little bit more in line with what I would expect in terms of like proportional changes. Which that's something to be very aware of when you are um, doing your sculpts is making sure like, you know, you, you might spend a little bit of time here in like the eye socket and before you know it, you've like moved things so subtly that shapes start to like shrink down. And I feel like that's ultimately what was starting to happen is I knew that this like this orbital area was like a really big area that I needed to address in the sculpt. And once I started to kind of address it, I, I'm happy with some of the forms, you know, like with how the lids are looking and things like that. But um, I started to kind of like maneuver things back down and push them down so that they weren't reading as well proportionally with the rest of the head. So that does have a ten tendency of happening for me at least. 
but you just got to be aware of it and, you know, take a break from the model and then you'll come back and you can kind of reevaluate some of that stuff. So. Feel like there's some good shaping going on through the face so far. Like I said, I kind of want to hopefully like solidify some of these forms, maybe do another like Z remesh on this guy and then, um, you know, start, which I kind of already have, start uh, adding in some of these like secondary shapes, which you can see like some of the the breaking up here where the shape is getting a little bit smaller is kind of what I want to aim for for this stream. So try and be productive with my time. Okay, how's it going, guys? Sorry, I saw that there's a couple of highs in there. How's everyone's morning going? Hey, how's it going, Cho? Anyone got any plans for the weekend? Playing any games, doing anything fun? I uh, just started playing. So if you've come to the streams before, I've probably mentioned this, but I am a big uh, Resident Evil fan, and I just started playing the D DLC that came out this week, and that is always a great time. That was That's probably what I would consider my game of the year is the Resident Evil 4 remake, which is hard because there's, like, there's been a ton of, of really, really good games this year so it's kind of hard to pick one but that's kind of what i'm leaning towards at this point um can't wait for the creature stream yeah uh like i said i have a couple of ideas i i want to pick something um i thought for a second like oh well maybe i'll just bring on the uh the creature that i've been doing on my personal stream the the dinosaur head because that one's already pretty far along but i was like i i don't want to like alienate the people on um that haven't been to those streams you know so i'm going to kind of leave that one there and try and pick something that is a little bit more uh just for this stream i i got to find what I want to do. Like I said, I have, I have like a library of concepts. Like anytime I see a concept on like Instagram or, um, on ArtStation, I save it to a folder, uh, just so that I have it for the future. And I can tell you 99% of those I don't ever end up touching, uh, or working on. Like I would love to, don't get me wrong. I would love to like have enough time to make every single concept that I see um or that i like but unfortunately i don't um for for example like i always see concepts and i'm like ooh, maybe i could like knock that out in like a day but in reality like i'm not a fast sculptor so i know i couldn't so i'm pretty selective with what kind of concepts i do pick because i want to um pick characters that i really like doing and things that i feel like i can you know Kind of succeed at making but um yeah i have a couple of ideas and i was i was thinking about you know maybe something like horror -y just because it's it's almost halloween you know so that was originally where my mind started to go but because this this piece i feel like is so far at this point felt like we might as well just kind of try and take it um a little bit further in this stream so which I feel like the nice thing is with this piece, we're kind of at that, the point where I really start to enjoy the sculpting most is when um, I've gotten like the primary forms and things in and I can just start worrying about the secondary forms. 
because that's when like stuff really starts to come to life is with all these secondary forms and just breaking up some of those bigger shapes adding the little nuances to the surface and things like that so that's what i really like to do so which one thing that you'll notice and this isn't by necessarily by intent is i'm not the best about like using things like damn standard and stuff like that um i have a tendency of just kind of like sculpting my my uh forms in with clay tubes and stuff and like obviously i'll make like harsh cuts and things like that if i need to um but i tend not to use those brushes and i don't really know why um i that's not to be said that i i don't use them at all like i'm using it right now but I kind of forget to use them sometimes. It's really blobby down here. A little bit lower uh can you tell us a little bit about your story about how you f uh your first time uh getting a job in the game industry uh yeah i've i've definitely talked about this story in the past but i'm always happy to um talk about it you know i think it's a good way to um for people to get a little bit of insight into like someone's journey so for me uh i went to school or sorry i'm going to give you like the long drawn out version you know this is usually what i do but i th I think for one it, it just kills time and two it provides a uh, insight into you know my journey a little bit more um so i originally started doing 3d back in high school um i started with blender and you know that's how i got introduced to 3d and I didn't know at that time, like what I wanted to do. I, I knew I wanted to work with 3d. Cause like I, you know, I fell in love with it. Like the first, the first time I used it and I was like, this is like the coolest thing that I could ever possibly imagine like doing with my life. Um, you know, I really enjoyed it. I've always liked art as a kid and growing up. And so I, I knew I wanted to like do something with 3d and luckily the college that was by um that was in my hometown of the university of new mexico was starting a program uh that was meant to be like a way of bridging people into getting jobs um like in film there was a sony image works in in albuquerque that they were trying to like funnel people into so they built a program at the school that was specifically dedicated towards like using some of the instructors that worked at uh sony image works and you know cultivating students so that they could just funnel them in directly into a job um and so that was what unm was originally meant to do but uh if any of you guys are aware um visual effects houses come and go really quickly uh you know they can they can be here one day and they can be gone the next and that's ultimately what ended up happening with sony imageworks is they decided to move to vancouver so with that went a lot of the talent and teachers from the program that i was in so because of that, I was left learning like 3D and things like that from um, from a guy who taught, who was was an architecture teacher, which you know I'm sure that he is great in architecture, but he didn't he didn't know how to become a 3D character artist. He didn't know how to you know become a vfx artist he didn't he didn't know those things so he kind of was just teaching classes which that's how it was with a lot of the instructors that's just one of the examples but um so because of that at my college i kind of didn't really receive um the best information to get into 
the games industry. Um, I kind of had to self teach myself a lot of things. Um, and while I was in college, I like taught myself ZBrush, um, by using resources like this, like they used to have like, um, a bunch of stuff on their site. And there was a couple of people on YouTube that like did some ZBrush stuff. And so that was how I started learning was I just watched a, a bunch of, um, YouTube videos essentially and learned that way. And so I kind of self-taught myself a lot about ZBrush while I was in college. Um, and then once I finished college, I, I knew that there was no earthly way that I would get a job in the game industry. So what I started to do then was I took classes at CGMA. Sorry, I know that this is like the long, long roundabout information, but I think that the context and um, like some of this extra stuff is insightful for people. So um, yeah, so I finished college, I got a degree in film and media, and I decided that I was not ready for trying to find a job because I knew I wasn't going to be able to. So what I did was I went to um, CG Masters Academy um, and there I started to take classes that were taught by people that worked in the game industry um, and which was that that in and of itself was really what I needed from the beginning was people who were like, this is how you use the tool. This is, you know, step a b and c but not only that they were also providing um art fundamentals and that was really the biggest thing that made a difference i feel like for me was because at that point in my career i i knew how to use zbrush you know like i could sculpt something i could get by and make something but i didn't have the art fundamentals behind it that made it a good looking piece. And that is what I really learned while I was at CGMA was how to kind of, you know, work by making primary, secondary, and tertiary forms and making sure that I followed that hierarchy to make a sculpt that looked good. And so that I really started to learn at CGMA. And that's when I feel like a lot of my stuff started to get better. So I went through CGMA and, um, you know, was learning a lot, but I still never felt like I was quite good enough to get a job in the game industry. And so um, because of that, I ended up taking a mentorship after I um, finished my classes there. I took a bunch of classes while I was at CGMA, by the way. I like took most of their character art classes. I took um, their, I took a couple of environment art classes as well. And yeah, so I took I took a large portion of their catalog. And so um once I had finished that, I still kind of felt like I wasn't wasn't prepared. So I took a mentor I did a mentorship and that I made like a full character start to finish. Um and while I was doing that, I, you know, I had gotten some some recognition from it from from my mentor he was like yeah this is good like you know i think you did a really good job with this and i was like oh that's awesome like you know i i didn't really feel like it looked that great but um you know there was a little bit of that extra support there and so at this point i you know i had been doing 3d for probably like i think that this was in 2017 and I started in 2011, so I'd been doing 3D in school for six years um, at this point. And then uh, after that, I decided to participate in an art station challenge. Um, and it was the Wild West theme. And I was like, oh, hey, like, let's participate in this just because I want to like get a portfolio piece. Um, that was really the only intent that I had for that uh for participating in that and so i did that and then um some by some earthly chance i managed to win first place in it and so um when i won that was kind of when i started to get contacted by studios and asking if i was interested in um working for them so i had i had talked to a couple of different studios and then i ended up landing at turtle rock um so that's kind of how I got into the game industry. Um, 
and mind you, you know, like I, and, and part of the reason I like to tell this story is because I think it's insightful and providing some information that like people that do get into the game industry, like it's not always like you start in college, you graduate college, and then three months later, you get a job in the game industry for a lot of people, like probably a vast majority of people, especially doing character art, you probably start doing 3d in some other fashion which is true for me prior to um getting my job at turtle rock i was working at a, a contractor doing like vr sort of material um and so that kind of like paid my bills while i was able to you know keep practicing in my free time and learning all of this stuff um and, and just getting better at it and so that I think is really important because I didn't just like graduate and then get a job um, in the industry. So, and, and I know a lot of people are like, oh, I'm graduating soon. How can I get a job? The reality is, you know, you might be able to get a job right out of college, but a lot of people, you probably won't. So if that's the case, don't be discouraged by that, um, obviously, but uh, just keep, just keep working at it and, and you can, you can eventually get there. It just, it takes time. It takes patience. You know, this is a very um, competitive industry and a lot of people want to do it and be a part of it. But uh, if you just kind of keep at it, you definitely can get in there. So that is what I would say. Um, that was, that's kind of my uh, long winded way of how I got into games and how I got a job. And then, you know, once you get into the games industry, um, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward to kind of find jobs. I think the hardest part is getting in. And then once you're in, it's, it's easier to like kind of move from studio and opportunity to opportunity. Um, more so once you like ship your first game, uh, I, I noticed that once I had like shipped back for blood, then that's when it was like, um, studios were like, Hey, you've shipped a game. Do you want to come help us? Or, you know, things like that. So, um, that is what I, I guess, you know, can say about that. Um, so that, that's a little bit about how I got to here. Um, you know, and again, part of the reason why I like to share that story is because I, you know, I get questions like, Oh, do you suffer with imposter syndrome or like self-doubt? Oh, absolutely. I think, I think 99% of artists in the industry probably do. I'm one of them, you know, like I was very doubtful about the idea of, um, applying to a studio to begin with. And so I didn't, you know, like up until I got the, um, offer to interview after the art station challenge, I hadn't, I had applied to like a couple of internships, but I kept telling myself like, oh no, you're not ready. You're not ready. You're not good enough. You're not ready. And, um, I kind of let that, that voice distract me from the fact that I probably could have applied sooner. Um, but you know, it, it, it panned out, uh, it worked out for me. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit about how I got in. Um, uh, let's see. How do you go about sculpting animals accurately that have a lot of fur covering the main forms? Uh, sometimes hairless reference is difficult or disturbing. Yeah. So, um, usually what I do is I just find like the animal anatomy, um, or, or like you can find like equiches of different animals, like, like for dogs, for example, um, I can just show you like, I have animal references, which are like kind of hard to, you know, make out some of the forms. Um, but you also have like things like this, where you can make out like the anatomy and the structure. And, you know, I have different things like this, where I'm able to kind of like view the dog's forms and like what muscles are making up those forms. And um, it, it's difficult. Don't get me wrong. Like, and that's why I think, uh, that's why I wanted to practice this on stream is because although it seems like doing a dog would be pretty straightforward, like there isn't a ton of reference of hairless 
dogs. I mean, obviously there's things like this, which this is really good. But if you can find reference like this, this stuff is is incredibly valuable because you can really kind of just see what the forms are doing and things like that. So animals with hair, definitely, uh, definitely hard to do. That is for sure. But um, if you search, you can you can definitely find stuff. So. Uh, let's see. Hi, Jared. Loved your art station art test videos. Learned a lot from watching your work. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm glad, uh, glad you learned something from it. Um, you know, in all honesty, I feel like half the time that I've made tutorials or, uh, YouTube videos or anything like that, I'm like, is anyone actually going to learn anything from this? Cause half the time I feel like I'm rambling, but um, I do appreciate that. That's it's very encouraging and um, appreciated. Makes me want to make more things, you know. Okay, that form looks really, really bad. Um, let's see. What was the most difficult thing for you to grasp, but you knew you had to learn to make it a uh, form? Form structure, I think for me, took a very, very long time to grasp. Um, actually, th there's multiple aspects of the pipeline. Um, I remember when I first started doing 3D, I thought that UVs were like the most like obscure sort of idea that I couldn't wrap my mind around. But then um, once I started to get used to it, it wasn't, they're, they're not bad after that, which like now they're, they're like second nature to me. Um, then it was probably texturing. Texturing seemed really, really foreign to me. Um, but that's because back before all the fancy tools that we have now of like Substance Painter and Mari and all those things, people used to texture in Photoshop. And so that was how I learned to originally texture. I like had a class on, on, or, or that showed how to texture in Photoshop. And it was like so obscure and abstract and like just really hard for me to grasp. Um, but then I took another texturing class and that idea or that class was taught in Mari, um, but those ideas still didn't change. It was all just really kind of hard for me to grasp. Um, but then just after a while, I finally like kind of made sense of it in a way that works for me, uh, my own brain. And... That was a hard one, um, but yeah, definitely form. Form has been a really, really hard one for me to kind of grasp because I think like you can look at, um, let's see if I can find like a good example. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay, so like here's a sculpt of a dog. We've all seen dogs, but how do you break it down into simpler forms and how do you break those simpler forms down into more complex forms? And then how do you break those complex forms into tertiary detail? For me, that was always very, very hard. So it like came down to like doing things like this, you know, um, understanding just simple shapes but like it's hard to view things in that nature when you're not super um experienced in it you know but so that took a lot of time for me and then also like it took a lot of time for me to kind of bridge the gaps between each stage so like here i would have my primary forms and it's like okay well when do i jump to my secondary forms which that just kind of comes with time and experience i think at least for me um of taking it to like okay it looks like a dog like for for example right now i would say like my primary forms are pretty much there um i'm moving into some of my secondary forms you know like adding in some of like this let's we'll just draw on this real quick this shape you know that is one of my primary forms but now i've taken that shape and i've broken it down into more forms you know so finding the the point when that stuff can happen was always really really hard for me so 
I think uh, because of that, because it was hard for me, I have like a really big, um, I have a, a an appreciation for form work because it took me so long to kind of like understand it, you know? And um, yeah, so that's that's definitely what I would say is was like the hardest thing for me to kind of like understand um was definitely definitely form work um but now i'm i feel like i'm pretty capable at it for the most part you know to some extent sometimes i still even struggle with it sometimes i feel like i don't i don't do the best job of uh making my forms quite as good as I should. Like right here, these forms are not good. This should be kind of going like this. It's a little bit better. Makes a little bit more sense. Which also, um, so back to the idea of like um, animals and that have fur and things like that. Usually you can find someone who has sculpted an animal and I would recommend like looking at their work. That's usually what I do when it comes to animals at least. Like other things, I, I also reference other art artists and things like that. But especially when it comes to like animals with fur, if there's someone who has a greater understanding of an animal or who's like a more like an animal sculptor i'll see if they have some sort of like equache that can inform some of my decisions um because it is hard to kind of find some of that information um online like you know for for example like seeing the back of the ears most images don't take a picture of the dog from back here so like if you can find uh someone who has like turnarounds stuff like that's always super useful so i definitely would check that out if you haven't um let's get this up in here Uh, let's see, um, hey, how's it going, Steamworks? Uh, very insightful story and very encouraging for those who are trying to get in the industry. Yeah, and that's, you know, and I remember when I was in college, um, it always seemed so, like, foreign to me, like, how people actually got in, like, well, what does their portfolio look like when they got in? What do you, like what kind of quality are they making when they got in? Like how many pieces did they have? And a lot of that stuff does kind of feel um, very hard to find. And so like I try and, you know, provide a little bit of that information when I can or when people ask about it. Cause you know, I know that I definitely was curious about that stuff. Um, and, and it's easy to get caught up in like the social media aspect of it, like where you go on art station or Instagram and like you see like, oh, this person has 10 million followers or that's an exaggeration, obviously. But like that following has probably been accrued over years and years and years and years of work. For for example, like if you if you looked at my following, I've been making 3D now since 2011. It's 2013 or it's 2023. I've been making 3d for 12 years at this point not all of it has been online but i've been posting online since like 2016 maybe 17 so it's like that's like years and years and years that i've like pushed my stuff out there and so it, it takes a long time to grow a following to get the career it's not just like a you know you put one portfolio piece out and then you get a job and you know, as much as everyone would like that to be the case, that's that's just not really how it works. Um, so yeah, definitely don't get discouraged. Um, it's a journey. Enjoy the journey. You know, um, have fun making the stuff and getting there. That is 
the fun stuff. Um, I mean, obviously working in, in getting paid to do this stuff is, is great. And I don't ever take that for granted, but you know, um, definitely enjoy the process. Don't rush it. Don't, I, I would say majority of people don't expect it to be like a one to two year process. Cause unless you're paying for like a really good school and, and instructors that know what they're doing and you have, you're like great at learning probably won't be that quick, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, but me as a testament, it took, um, took me a long time, you know, and that's, that's part of why I like to talk about it is because I think most of us, it probably will take a good amount of time as well. So, um, uh, I've got a little question. What tablet do you use? Um, so I use a Cintiq, uh, 24 pro, I think, um, it's not the most current model. It's like their last one with like this, like weird little remote thing. Um, I, I, that's what I use now. Um, for, a, I I've used like majority of Intuos's products at this point. Um, when I first started, I used a bamboo tablet, uh, for a while. And then I used an Intuos tablet for a while. And then, um, I invested in buying my own Cintiq. So that was like the Cintiq 24 HD, um, which it's like on like the, the arm base that you could like move and swivel down. And I was on that one for like, I don't know, probably like 10 years. Um, but then I just, I upgraded to this one this year. So uh, that is what I currently use, um, which I know I've gotten, I've gotten questions about this in the past, but like, oh, do you recommend a tablet or, or like a, an, a pen tablet, like an Intuos or whatever? I would, I would say whatever, you know, you're personally comfort, comfortable using, um, the, the Cintiq is great, but I know a lot of people don't like having their hand in their way, uh, which for me doesn't doesn't bother me so i i don't really care too much if if my hands in the way or not um but i do know some people get kind of annoyed by that fact so um if that is you then you know maybe uh maybe a cintiq isn't best and an intuos is a little bit of a better choice um I like both. I, I actually still use my Intuos occasionally when I'm when I'm uh, like out of town or things like that or or working remote. Um, I'll I'll use that. But just kind of depends. Um, but I definitely would recommend one if you if you don't have one of those two. I would recommend one. I know the last stream. Uh, I think someone was you know saying that they used a, uh, a mouse to sculpt. I would not recommend doing that um, just because of the health, um, not risks. I mean, I guess risks that can be associated with it in terms of like um, getting carpal tunnel and things like that. I would, I would recommend not, not sculpting with a mouse because uh, you're going to just mess up your hands and in the long run, these are, these are your best friends if you do this for a living. So I would, I would definitely recommend one. Uh, this shape needs some rework. Oops.
Sorry, got distracted there, guys. Um, let's see, where was I at? Uh, how long have you been in the 3D industry for? Um, so in total, uh, I guess it depends on what you consider the 3D industry. I've been doing games professionally since 2019. So I worked at Turtle Rock for four years um, on the development for Back for Blood. And after that, uh, I left and came to Firewalk, which I've been at Firewalk for like the past almost 10 months now. Um, so about almost close, um, I'll be at about five years here in, in like two months. Um, so that's, that is doing AAA games. Uh, prior to that, I was working for um, a company where I was doing 3D work and and the the level was was like a lower bar. Um, but I was working there for maybe three to four years. Um, three years, I think, at least. I think, yeah, I think it was about three years. So I've probably been getting paid to do 3D for probably the last like, uh, I don't know, like seven, eight years maybe. Um, so yeah, but uh, it, when it comes to doing like AAA games, um, yeah, over the last uh, last like five years is is how long I've been doing AAA games for. So. Why did my music stop? Yes, I am still listening. Thank you. Um, hello, Jared. I just or I graduated last year and did a job in a VR studio, but now I want to improve my skills in ZBrush to work as a character artist. I thought of uh, I thought about to sculpt blocking of different characters or creatures because I go too quickly into details. Do you think that's a good idea? And do you re recommend some exercise? Yes. Uh, if you are uh, yes, go into blocking. You should always block your characters out um, because, you know, I can use one of my sculpts for an example. So here, here is the original, this is, this was the original block out for this character. So this is just simplifying it. I don't necessarily always like go this simple with my block outs, but um, this led to that. So the reason that it looks the way that it does is because I'm going step by step. If you're jumping into detailing really quickly, there's a high probability that you're not doing a good job of establishing your primary forms and you're not even establishing secondary forms, which is the case with the majority of people. I used to do that um, where I would like, you know, I, I didn't understand what exactly the secondary forms were. And so I would go from like sculpting like ahead into adding a bunch of detail and at the end of the day my model would look like poo poo because of it um so definitely definitely work on blocking your characters out um take it slow like deet and 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 this is another like pivotal piece of advice that i heard but i didn't listen to and the reason that i didn't listen to it was because you know, you see sculpts like, I don't know, we'll say God of War, for example, and you see all these pores and all these details and you're like, oh, well, if I just add those, my sculpt will look as good as that. Well, that's where we're wrong and your sculpt doesn't look good because of the details and pores. The sculpts look good because they exist on their own from a primary and a secondary point of perspective those forms are good and so the details are just like little icing on top i could sculpt this into the ground with good solid primary and secondary forms and i could show it to someone and they'd be like yeah that looks great you know making a good strong model and then but if i like threw details on it they might be like oh yeah that still looks great so if you can make a sculpt that looks great in primary and secondary forms you're going to be making a good sculpt. If you make a model that has primary forms, no secondary forms, and has a bunch of details that may or may not look good, you're probably going to have a crappy model. So um, definitely make a good block out. Take it in steps. Don't rush into um, making details 
I can tell you that for a, a majority of my sculpts now, I don't even detail them. I don't detail them in ZBrush. I'll add details for certain things if I need to, but I very rarely do the detailing phase um, unless it's like skin. If it's, if it's cloth, if it's damage, um, things like that, I tend not to do a lot of uh, detail work. So like, just to kind of drive this point home, I can show you some of my models where they don't have a ton of detail. Um, let's see, what is a good one? Yeah, we'll look at my frog, which this does have details for the skin, um, but it doesn't have details on like the armor and all of that stuff. It's all just existing from forms. So that is, again, just to drive the point home. If you have details, that's not important. Like this stuff, this stuff is all great, but all of this stuff exists without... Um, details so let's see is this this is the right file to necessarily show this stuff on but we'll see but yeah so you can see all of these models none of them have any detail they weren't they aren't important to have detail like all of that stuff can exist without the detail and this body and this head this stuff all existed like could stand on its own without this detail. It would still look like a, a strong model, hopefully. And that's that's more important than the detail. So yeah, I, I, I don't think I can hit that nail on the head much harder, but that is the way of, um, that is a clear indicator of someone who understands sculpting and those that don't. Um, and so usually like when re reviewing portfolios and looking at things like that, that is like the dead giveaway of, of someone who could be hired and who couldn't. Um, and, and when you look at portfolio pieces, you can usually tell when someone doesn't have that understanding and it is very, very important. So, um, work on that, work on, work on having, uh, primary and secondary forms and, and making a sculpt that can exist with just those and not any detail, and that will help you uh, immensely. Actually, I guess I do have another one that I could show, but I've kind of derailed at this point, so it's not, not super important. But hopefully I drove that point home. Primary and secondary forms are the keys to making a good, strong, and believable character. If you don't have those, then your model is probably going to suffer. Um, so, yeah. Work on those forms, kids. Um, in terms of, like, exercises that I would recommend, I would recommend starting from, like, uh, let's see which one was it things like this where you are just um blocking out the generic shapes of things and then building up from there which this in and of itself is a hard thing to do um because i think you know it's hard to simplify a lot of this stuff it's hard to observe and and break things down to small shapes to try and create something more complex but like you can see here in the silhouette you know it has semblance of a dog. It's not not the greatest in the world, but it has some of that shape already that you would associate with a dog. And I was able to do this in, you know, I don't know, 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, something like that. Um, so, and, and it creates a good starting point. So, yeah, I would do exercises like that, just simplifying things. Um, it'll, it'll help you in the long run. And, um, if you can do that and make good primary and secondary forms, you'll be, you'll be off to the races. Um, what software do you use to complete models? Is it just ZBrush and substance? No. Um, so I use a couple of different models. Um, I use, uh, ZBrush for my sculpting. Um, I use ZBrush or Maya for modeling, um, like, more complex things usually. Sometimes I'll do it in, in 
ZBrush. It just depends if I feel confident enough to like use a Z modeler to, to get the results that I need. Um, but I will do my low poly modeling in Maya and I will do my topology and UVs, both of those in Maya. Um, and then once I do that, I'll use like Substance Painter or actually not Substance Painter. I'll use Marmoset is where I like to do my bakes personally. So I'll do my bakes in there. Um, and then I, I paint my textures in Substance and I usually render my characters in Marmoset or um, Unreal. That's, that's usually where I render my characters at so those are the tools that i use um, for hair i use uh what's it called gs curve tools and hair shop um, i also use xgen for hair sometimes just depends just depends my mood more than anything um let's see what else uh yeah I think that's about it. Try not to get too like software convoluted, um, but that's kind of just the the tools that I have a tendency of using for my pipeline and what I'm what I'm most proficient at um, in doing. So, so that is my tool set. Like I said, feel free to use or use whatever like works best for you. That's just kind of what I have used over the years and I um, am most proficient with and can kind of get the results quickly. I have my own like workflow for how I make models and stuff like that. So um, let's see. Uh, do you think the creation of human characters will become more automated in the future? And would it be better to invest more time into stylized creatures or hard surface rather than likeness sculpts other than to improve observation skills? Um, so I think a lot of that stuff already exists. Um, so like we can scan people so we can get pretty much likeness if we really want to. Um, there are people that I know that specialize in that. I don't, specialize in likeness or like portrait sculpting um in any way i i don't really care for it all that much um i'll do it occasionally for certain things but it's not not my cup of tea uh but will it be more automated in the future um i mean it could be but i mean i think everything kind of at this point is getting more automated um but yes, I would say, I, I think for me personally, I would say doing stylized stuff is where you're going to have the most freedom as an artist or, or the most control. So um, if you like being able to like kind of sculpt things and have your own style imbued in them, then that is where you're going to see it. Whereas like likeness and stuff you you know you can see some of you can see style and, and things like that but not as not as prominently um so yeah i don't know i don't know if it'll actually be automated i you know i kind of try not to think too much about that stuff but um i don't know i guess it just depends what you like to do if you if you like to make portrait stuff i'm sure that you could find a niche that would pay you for that um but you know i do think that uh the closer you get to likeness the less in demand you could possibly be just because there are a lot of capabilities of just like scanning an actor and getting a likeness and you know, they could hand that work to you and, and um, you could clean it up, but, you know, just depends if that's what you want to do or not. I personally like the process of making things uh, from scratch, so that's part of why I kind of lean more towards, like, styles, stylistic stuff, um, you know, so. These 
forms are a little weird. Um, let's see. Uh, hey, Jared, I hope you're doing well today. The dog is looking better and better each stream. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I had kind of hoped that because, you know, there was, I'm not gonna lie, after last stream, I really did not like what it looked like. I was like ready to, to move on from it. But I feel like now I'm kind of like, okay, you know, if I called it here, I would be happy with how it looks. But that last stream, who man, I was not I was not feeling what that uh what it looked like, but we got over the hump, which usually that is like half of my problem too is is getting over the hump um to get something that looks good. But I feel like we finally did it. I feel like the proportions are are working um better. I mean there's I'm sure there's still things that could change. Um, like this bottom jaw, I probably need to do a little bit of fixing on that. I do want that bottom part of the mouth to be visible. Let's see, let's look at some reference, see what we can see. Yeah. Yeah, and see, and like this is another spot where it's like I, uh, you know, it's always hard because it's like trying to find images of like the underside of a dog's mouth. Like I have to like grab my own dog and like lift her head up and be like, okay, what's going on down here? You know, sometimes, so honestly, half the time that's that's the hardest part about sculpting is like trying to find the information you need to actually make certain parts of it. Because from up here it looks fine, but as soon as you get down here, it's like, uh. I'm kind of winging some of this stuff, you know, because I don't have the information to really inform what that looks like. Which maybe I do. I don't think I do. Yeah, I don't. I didn't think I did. Oops. Small changes, small, small changes. Yeah, and I feel like our silhouette's looking okay. Looks like a dog, so that's, I guess, as good as it gets. Um, Let's see, what is your opinion for Blender over Maya? Just curious. Uh, I don't use Blender. I haven't used Blender in 12 years. Um, when I used it, it was not great. Um, I know it's better now. I know that, you know, a lot of people like it. I personally don't use it, so I don't really have enough to speak on whether it's a, a good tool or not. Um, I think it's like anything. If you can use it to get the results that you like, cool, great, you know, whatever. So I don't, I don't really have an opinion other than that. Um, so I use Maya purely because I used it in college, and at this point, I've been using it for 10 years, so I'm not going to switch unless there's, like, a specific reason for me to switch. Um, you know, like, I, I know I have friends and stuff who have are switching or are trying it out. Um, I wouldn't mind using it for, like, the viewport features, but that's not, like, an enough of an incentive for me to, like switch up my tool you know so um yeah so that's that's the big thing is i don't have enough incentive to go use blender um maybe at some point that'll change but right now i just i don't feel the need to but i think it's a fine tool if that's what you like to use but if you like to use maya that's also perfectly fine all just comes down to preference um, and it's all I, at the end of the day they're all just tools and so like 
I, I definitely don't get caught up in the like, oh, this is a better tool. I will say ZBrush is a better tool um, for sculpting. And, and, you know, that's not, I'm not just saying that just because I'm streaming on here, but I actually think that it is a good tool. And I, I was happy to pay for ZBrush when I did, um, you know, I think that they always made a very good product and I was always happy to support that. Down here is getting a little, a little bit weird. Yeah. Let's see, what did this look like before? Shoot, yeah, I could, starting to make it a little bit too chunky, I think. Let's come back down to a lower subdivision. I'm gonna reset current brush. Um, Jared, anyone you can recommend who makes tutorials and tips about look dev for characters? Um, not that I can think of. Um, I know that you can probably find some tutorials on YouTube. There's no one that I can really think of. I try to like provide some of that input. Like I have um, a couple of videos that I'm actually working on that'll probably be a little bit more related to that in the future, but um, those are still a little ways off. Um, no, I don't, I don't really have anyone that I can think of. But that being said, you know, roundabout way of saying if you're interested in uh, some texturing stuff or some more modeling stuff or things like that. Go check out my YouTube channel. Um, I make stuff over there as well. Uh, I stream over there as well as I have uh, some different tutorials that I've made for, for some of my characters. So um, check those out if you're interested. Um, but yeah. That is, uh, unfortunately, I don't. There, like I said, um, for characters specifically, uh, yeah, I can't really think of anyone who's done any videos on that. Like, look dev is kind of hard because it's somewhat subjective. Like, I do have like a a look dev tutorial on Marmoset in creating a skin shader. Um, I do have a a video on um my art station store for making eyes, which that does cover like the look development of them. Um, outside of that, I'm, yeah, I'm having a hard time thinking of anyone that comes to mind. So sorry about that. Um, likeness can help develop an eye for ob observing uh, and good to practice. Yeah, I mean, it definitely can. Definitely can help with observing. Um, but I think, or for me personally, I think part of uh, the way my brain works um, that can be good, but it also can be very, very bad because uh, with likeness. So again, to just inform you a little bit about like my personal background, I, when I first started doing 3D, I actually really, really, really liked doing people and portraits. And that kind of stemmed from the fact that I was, um, I guess I was afraid to kind of branch out in like create things and when i would like make portraits i was stuck in observing things like i was like well i don't have to like solve problems about form because i always have a reference of a person um so like it, it kind of was hard for me to break that that feeling and like adhering to like specific foundational rules that you would when you're making a portrait. Whereas like when I'm making like a creature, it's like I can take all of my knowledge and anatomy knowledge and things like that, but I can really kind of just make a hard pivot based on what I'm making, you know? So for me, that's, that's kind of, it, it was very much a different muscle to flex and it took me a long time to kind of like remove myself from that observation sort of mindset. Um, 
probably maybe it's not the case for everyone else. I just I know for me that was hard. Uh, so it, it is good to learn how to observe, but I got really stuck in that idea of like adhering to reality very much, um, too much, you know, and and I think it was to a detriment of like my pieces and like I wasn't I wasn't making things. Um, I wasn't making like cool things, you know, so. This whole area I have completely neglected. And let's see if we can find something useful. Um, hey, where do you usually pose your models? Um, I usually pose them inside of ZBrush. Um, uh, yeah, I, I usually pose them in here just because I can like correct shapes and things like that. Um, also, I am by no means a master at uh what's it called um rigging and by no means a master i mean i suck at it so i don't i don't really rig my models very often i have a couple of times um but i tend to just do it in here because i feel like it's quicker so that is kind of what i do see do i have any nose pictures i do Um, does the company require you to use certain software or you, can you decide for ourselves what software, uh, that we usually use and specialize in? Um, kind of, um, so for example, like if you were to be making characters, um, and you were to be making high polys you most likely are going to be using ZBrush. Um, I don't know anyone that uses anything outside of ZBrush in the game industry for like the the sculpting. Um, you know, I, I obviously like Mudbox might be one that will use it, uh, but I'm sure that there are some situations where people use it. But the thing is, is if I was to make a character sculpt there isn't a good way to be like oh well i made this sculpt and hand it off to someone who uses blender they're not going to be able to like open my file and and work with it um so the source files are usually always going to be sculpted in in zbrush um but there are other options for like modeling stuff or doing your uvs in low poly say you are more comfortable in blender you can do those things in Blender, 
um, but you'll have to export all of your information and bring it into Maya at the end. Um, because that's probably where the more standardized part of the, the pipeline is. So you can use certain tools. Um, but again, where I think things come into play is if someone's going to touch that asset asset later, then it probably has to be a more standardized tool. So ZBrush, for example. So like if, if we were in a pipeline and everyone else is using ZBrush, but you're like, oh, I want to sculpt in Blender, I could see that being a problem unless you were to take all of your models and put them inside of ZBrush and then you hand off that as your source uh, asset. Um, then maybe that's fine, but that's a lot of work, a lot of like extra work that probably isn't necessary. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm sure you can to some extent, but for a majority of things, I probably wouldn't. Uh, you know, if someone was like, oh, I like to sculpt in Blender, and then I had to open up their file and like figure out Blender because they sculpted in Blender, I wouldn't like that. Um, and I don't think a lot of people would. So yeah, it just depends. Things for like modeling, you can probably do some of that stuff in Blender, like where you do your low poly and UVs. You could probably do that in Blender, bring it over into Maya at the end of the process. Um, but as long as you're like the big tools that someone else may have to open um are are using more standard tools you're probably fine so zbrush substance painter um you'll you'll probably be using those standardized tools um like marmoset i use that for baking i also know people who use substance painter for baking but me using that tool doesn't necessarily affect them um, because it, I'm still going to hand them a substance painter file and they'll be able to open it and still use the information the way that it was intended. So it just kind of depends. Um, but most likely software, uh, if it like impacts other artists, um, but in certain aspects, you can probably use a specific software for a specific outcome, you know? So yeah, that is what I would say. And that's what I've seen in my experience. Like I said, I've seen people use Blender for, for modeling and then they just bring over their stuff into, into ZBrush um, or, or yeah, I've seen someone use 3ds Max. I, I know a lot of people that use 3ds Max, um, but they bring their files over into Maya after the fact, or at least that's their like central drop point for handing off the low poly to someone else. Um, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure about like the, the ZBrush thing. I definitely think everyone's going to be using ZBrush substance. I'm pretty sure everyone's going to be using substance, but like in between tools, you can be a little bit more flexible on. So I do know people that use 3ds Max. I do know people that use Substance or uh, what's it called? Um, Blender. You know, I use Marmoset. Uh, some people use just Substance. Just kind of depends, you know. see um in your experience as a character artist do you get time to talk to the concept artist to clarify things about the concept that you're working off off of uh yeah i mean i if i have questions i usually well it depends i've i've worked in different pipelines where sometimes like the concept is more defined um so like a lot of the questions are solved um but I've also worked in pipelines where the concept is a lot more up to interpretation. Um, and in those situations, like you can, yeah, you can talk to, to the concept artist. There, there's not a problem with that. But in a lot of times, like they may just provide you with a, a 2D sketch and you kind of just have to fill in the blanks. 
Um, it's that's definitely not unheard of. I've I've done that for characters before. I've done characters where they started out as like just a 2D sketch. You know, there's not a lot of information of, of like to define what the forms are or like what exists on the character, and I just kind of have to do my own sort of making of forms and things like that. Um, but yeah, usually like if you have a question like, oh, well, what is this prop or can you draw me a version, like a more detailed version of this prop, depending on their schedule, they probably can, um, or depending like the importance of the asset on the character, they probably will. But sometimes they, you know, it might be like, well, there's a carabiner, but all it looks like is the silhouette of a carabiner. You probably could have some artistic freedom depending on, um, um, yeah, you could have some artistic freedom on, on like giving that direction as long as it like adheres to what the art direction for the project is, you know, just depends though. Um, uh, what was, what is your full workflow to get final renders? What do you use for texturing and have final render? Um, so I, my, my overall workflow is I sculpt things in ZBrush, sometimes make things in Maya. I'll go to Maya for low poly. Um, I'll do my UVs in there usually for personal work. I, this, I have like an abbreviated version of this. Um, but for production, yeah, I'll, I'll do my low polys in, uh, in Maya, bring it into Marmoset to do my, um, my bakes and I'll bring my bakes over into substance painter. I'll texture in substance painter. Um, and then I usually render in Marmoset or unreal is the tools that I like to use. So those are the kind of tools that I use. That's pretty much my workflow, um, even in production, or that is like my production workflow, uh, except for like the, the Marmoset. It's, you know, I worked in Unreal um, for my engine. But yeah, that is that is kind of what I do. All right, we're probably going to go for like another 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll call this stream. So if you have any questions, make sure to throw them in. Um, let's see. I bet working with John Grello helps. Yeah, John John was great. John was a was an awesome awesome uh, concept artist. Super cool to work with. Um if you watched the Art Station learning course that I did, that that character was based off of one of his concepts. So yeah he was a cool dude to work with for um majority of that project though uh for uh back for blood i worked with a concept artist his name is gu yang um and he uh he currently works at naughty dog now um but he's he had some awesome designs um he was the one primarily responsible for a lot of the or not primarily, he was the one responsible for the uh, designs for the Special Infected. So um, all of the Special Infected that I did were based off of his work, except for like the last couple, um, like the cultist ones, those were John um, and the Abomination, or not the Abomination, um, I don't remember the last the last like big character I did that one was uh John's as well. So, which that was like a 2.0 version of the one that Goo had done. Um so, not very often do you get to like make the same character or or boss kind of thing twice. Um so that was an interesting challenge of of having to tackle that a second time. But I think the second one turned out well, so.
Let's see. Yeah, he's awesome. Love all the team's work. Congrats on everything. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it was a it was a fun project. And I think for me, you know, I had mentioned a little bit earlier in the stream, like I I had always made more people, you know, that was kind of what I was comfortable with. But on on that project was when I really realized that I um liked doing creatures because they were kind of like, hey, here's a creature, go make it. And I wasn't super confident with making creatures. Uh, so like the wretch, that was the first monster that I made on that game, aside from like a couple of zombies, but you know, those are still like inherently human. Um, but that was the first one that I made. And I remember being like, ah, uh, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, like not feeling super confident about it, but I'm glad that that happened because that really like made me get outside of my comfort zone in, in sculpting. And because of that, I love doing creature stuff now so and and that's what i what i like to do most is just weird crazy creatures and things where i can just sculpt form you know those are always the fun ones where you're just sculpting form Um, do you retopo in Maya before subdividing the model in ZBrush or do you, uh, use automatic ZBrush retopology before subdividing the model? Um, so in ZBrush, what I do is, um, I'll start with something like this where it's all, you know, just very loose and, and this could even just be done with Dynamesh where you're just pushing and pulling. I would do something like Dynamesh like that. And then I would take it to an, another point that's similar to this. And then I would, um, yeah, do an automatic topology on it. And I would just keep doing that over and over and over again until I have the final final piece. I don't ever go to Maya to do um, like a topology on something. Um, as long as I have like control over like, you know, the eyelids and things like that, like that may be a case. So like for heads and things could potentially need that if you're really trying to like refine the eyelid shape. Um, but I, there's been times where I've, I just ignore it, you know, um, and I just kind of let the algorithm capture that stuff. And if it captures it, cool. And if not, I just kind of have to work around it. Like right now I could, I could definitely use another, um, pass it a topology on this guy. Um, but because of where we're at in the stream, I'm not going to do that right now. So yeah, um, awesome way to find a new passion. Yeah, it, it was, uh, but you know, it definitely took a lot of kind of on-demand learning because I, like I said, I was not, um, I was not very confident in doing creatures. Like I had done an anatomy, animal anatomy class and I had like, I think like sculpted like one creature up to that point. And it was very heavily following the design of the guy who made it. Um, but you know, it, it worked out and now I know I like creatures a lot. So let's see. Um, eyelids should be thicker than they are on a real person, right? Um, I think that they normally are just thicker than people perceive. Um, you definitely don't want to go too thick. I've I've done that before where it's like it looks like a shelf uh, on a character's eye. Um, but there there's usually like there's there's enough thickness there. Like this is is maybe a little too thick. Like, let's see. Eh, maybe not. But yeah, you can see like right here. So that's like the close, there's something in there is probably close to like the, the actual like thickness of the eyelid. Uh, yeah, you can see like, look how, how much real estate is actually there on that. And on this, the bottom lid, it's a little bit harder to tell. Um, let's see. 
yeah, the bottom lid doesn't have quite as much thickness, but it still has a little bit of a shelf. You can see like this, like white line of pixels. It's the same thing with people. Um, it, it's probably more prominent than you think, but also you don't want to like go something like this where it's, oops, that's the wrong brush. Something like this where it's like, you know, you could like lay foundation and build a house on how, um, how big that is, you know? Um, let's see. Hi, Jared. Maybe you remember my question about UDIMs and that stuff. I was the guy who participated on the Curtis Dog Contest and got third place. Appreciate your work and wish you a good day. Good. That's awesome, man. Uh, glad to hear that. Congrats on, on third place. That's, that's cool. Glad that, uh, worked out. It's always good to hear. Um... Let's see. Try and get some of this area a little bit more structure. Okay, I think that's good. Um, let's see, do you think that working remote is still a thing after COVID? I would love to work for studios in America, but want to stay in Europe, is that possible? Um, uh, in Europe, probably hard. Um, I mean, it, it's definitely a thing that's done here. Like I am, uh, I work for, a studio that's in Seattle and I'm not located in Seattle. Um, in a, in the U S it, it's definitely probably here to stay. Certain studios are kind of rolling it back. Like I know, um, I, I'm pretty sure like blizzard has rolled it back to some extent. Um, but for jobs that are overseas that I'm not as familiar with, um, in my opinion, I would assume it's probably a little bit harder just because, you know, you're like, for example, right now it's 825 in the morning here, whereas I'm assuming for you, it's, you know, pretty late in the day. Um, so there is like that disconnect of working times. So I think that that is probably the biggest factor that could come into play. Um, I'm sure that there are some studios that do it, but I'm not familiar with any. Um, so yeah, I don't know. You, you would definitely have to, to reach out to a studio that you're interested in and see, see what they have to say about it. Cause I'm, I'm not too sure on that. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure how it would work for, uh, someone that far you know, in, in, on a different continent. Um, if you ever feel you aren't able to meet a deadline on a character, is it possible to get more time for it? Or how do you deal with that in the industry? Uh, yeah, so um, it, we have producers um, and we usually have a lot of meetings to talk about where we're at in the pipeline and process. Um, you know, when I first started, that was something that I was always afraid of, like, oh, like, Am I going to be able to make a character in the deadline that's given? Um, I've never had an issue not meeting the deadline. Like obviously things slip or, you know, changes come in to play that they're like, oh, we have to fix this. And because of that, you lose a little bit of time. And, you know, uh, the, the date that you're supposed to hit becomes a little bit more unrealistic. I've had that happen plenty of times. Um, but as long as you're like communicating your schedule, to your producer, usually they're, they're fine with that. I've never been in a situation where they're like, oh, this is the deadline. You know, if you don't meet it, then you don't have a job. Um, it's usually like, hey, here's the deadline. So this has come up, I think because of that, we might end up slipping a couple of days or, you know, I might need a little bit of extra time. Um, and, and 
my experience as well, which I know that this isn't the case for everyone in industry, is um, the studios that I've worked at don't want you to crunch. <laughs> um, they don't want you to like, oh, well, you can't meet this deadline, so work over the weekend to to meet it. They're they're like, no, like let's let's make sure that we can give you the time that you need to finish it and so that you're not trying to kill yourselves. That being said, sometimes you do have to just like pull in a little bit of extra time on the weekends if if you um don't feel like you're gonna meet it. Like that's that's more dependent on you and your producer. There's been times where like I've worked a little bit after work, like an extra hour, maybe two, just to stay on schedule and um, get the character to a point that I like. So, you know, sometimes that that does happen, and I know people that do that as well. Um, but yeah, if you communicate with your producer, then they're, they're usually more than happy to try and work something out sometimes dates are set in stone because it does impact a certain department so because of that like you know those are situations where you may have to figure out a solution with your producer but that's that's kind of their job is to manage the schedule and as long as you're communicating with them you're usually fine so <clears throat> let's see um i really like your ui is it something that you can share um, I have gotten that question before. Um, I I plan to make it available at some point. I just haven't spent the time to like get everything together and um a little bit more organized. Like all of this stuff, sorry, I'm like pointing at my screen and you guys can't see. Like all of this stuff down here, that stuff I probably need to like organize a little bit better because right now there's like buttons down there that I don't use and you know. I would like to just make it a little bit more organized. But yeah, at some point I will have this UI available for people to download and use if they want to. There's nothing really too crazy about it, but, um, you know, it's fine. So yeah, let's see. Uh, we're going to take this last question. Um, I want to be a character artist 3D. Do you have any advice on how to be better tips, tricks? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um <sighs> Understand or so like technical things that you need to know. You need to know how to sculpt a character. You need to know how to make a low poly off of the character. You need to know how to do UVs for the character. You need to know how to texture the character. You need to know how to put the character in a final engine and put shaders together and do all that stuff. Um, those are like the technical skills. Um, you should also have a under from an artistic standpoint, you should have an understanding of anatomy. You should have a understanding of silhouette form structure um color light and how that plays a role into color um those are like more of the artistic principles that you you rely on um and from a like from a portfolio perspective you want to tailor your portfolio towards the studios that you want to work at. So if you want to work at Blizzard, then you should probably be making stylized characters that are more hand painted. If you want to work at somewhere like Naughty Dog, you should be making like realistic characters with realistic materials. Um, and yeah, which obviously those two uh, require two completely different skill sets. So, you know, you, you kind of just have to decipher what those skill sets are and, and how to... Um, bridge that gap so yeah so with that said thank you guys for coming out today uh this is a great stream a lot of great questions a lot of a lot of good chatting i feel like we were able to make a, some some progress let's do a little before and after see what we did um okay so still not completely finished with it but you know we're making progress, getting some more secondary shapes in there, things like that. Looks like a dog. I feel like we're we're over the the awkward hump of things. So that's great. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for coming, stopping by, hanging out. I appreciate it. If you guys are interested in following more of my work, um, I do also stream on my own YouTube channel, which if you just search Jared Chavez, uh, you should be able to find it relatively quickly. Um, over there, I do streams for, uh, you know, texturing, sculpting, um, 
any of those kind of things. I also do videos, YouTube, different YouTube videos on um, creation process. So make sure to check those out if you're interested. Um, also, you could find me on Instagram or um, social media or art station or things like that as well. Uh, if you want to keep up with like more of my current work, you can see that stuff there. So um, again, thank you guys for coming out, hanging out. I appreciate it. Appreciate the support. Um, and I will see you guys in the next one. All right.